My name is Jeff Petraka. I'm an educator at the DNA Learning Center in Cold Spring Harbor. When I'm not teaching molecular biology there, I am the curator of entomology out at the Long Island Aquarium in Riverhead, New York. One of the biggest things that we do at the DNA Learning Center in recent years is DNA barcoding. And sometimes it may not seem why it's such a valuable and important tool in biology. So I thought I would share my unique insight uh, being that I work in a butterfly exhibit and insect zoo out here, where I have a whole bunch of different exotic insects, spiders, and all other kinds of arthropods, and uh, sort of tell you why DNA barcoding is so important, especially in the fields of zoology and conservation. So I'm joining you today from our butterfly exhibit, and this is a live stream here, so let me give you a little show of what we, where, the location that we're at right now. So unfortunately, what with everything that's been going on in the world today, none of our guests are here to enjoy the butterfly exhibit. But every day I get an opportunity to come in here and sort of mess around with some of my favorite animals, butterflies and moths. And I have a whole bunch of different exotic insects and spiders from all over the world. So that's what my uh, regular job sort of entails. <clears throat> So let's talk a little bit about DNA barcoding. So before we do that, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen with you here. So before we do that, you know, we ask ourselves sort of what is DNA barcoding exactly? Oops, sorry. What is DNA barcoding exactly? Now, before we do that though, we sort of have to know what is DNA exactly? And, you know, just as a reminder, uh, DNA is a double helix. All living organisms contain DNA. And you can see in this image up here, we have the backbone of DNA. Almost kind of looks like a ladder that's twisted around like a spiral staircase. And the backbone of DNA is made up of sugar and phosphate. Between the sugar phosphate backbone, we have uh, A, T, Cs, and Gs, which are nitrogenous bases. Those nitrogenous bases, uh, the sequence of which contains the building blocks for proteins. Proteins are the uh, macromolecules that make up living things. And essentially DNA contains the building plans for all of those in an organism. And before we sort of talk more about barcoding, it's helpful to kind of understand a little bit more about what happens when sequence of DNA changes. So the sequence of bases that is. So uh, up on the board here, I have this word SNP which stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. So very often the sequence of DNA from one organism to another might have a substitution or a switch out when it comes to a single nitrogenous base. So we call those polymorphisms indicating many changes. So a single nucleotide polymorphism would simply refer to a single nitrogenous base or uh, building a nucleotide, that's the building blocks of DNA by the way, um, a single switch out essentially. And these, nuclei, these single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs are very important when it comes to understanding how organisms are related. So if you look on the uh, right-hand side of the screen here, you'll notice that we have a sequence of nucleotides uh, between multiple different organisms over time. And what it's showing you is how these random changes, these single nucleotide polymorphisms can come about just by random chance, just because of errors in DNA replication. And they can essentially lead to variable sequences between different organisms. This is sort of underlying the, the process of evolution at a molecular level. And so therefore, the more similar that a particular sequence of DNA is between two organisms, it might be inferred then that the more closely related those organisms are. And so this is sort of lies at the heart of DNA barcoding. So what exactly is it anyway? So if you guys think about uh, going to a supermarket or a store, uh, products uh, all have these little barcodes that you go to the checkout line and you scan them and they sort of uh, bring up on the computer information about the price and how, you know, whatever, you know, what they're going to charge you, what, what type of product it is. And that's kind of the same idea as DNA barcoding, except we're using a very, very short sequence of nucleotides, uh, the same sequence of nucleotides, I should say, across multiple different organisms and comparing the differences between them. Organisms that have similar barcodes, therefore, are probably more, more likely to be either the same organism or closely related organisms. 
And so on the screen here, you can, you'll notice that we have a whole bunch of different sequences that are sort of aligned together. So the image that you're seeing is literally called an alignment. And the colors, the different colored bars that you're seeing, those are single nucleotide polymorphisms, differences between each of the sequences uh, listed as well as ones before that. And so it kind of generates this image that looks very much like a barcode. Pretty neat. So essentially, barcoding is using DNA sequence to help identify organisms. And so when we talk about barcoding, it can sometimes, there's a lot of factors that can affect how well uh, your a, a barcoding region of DNA can, uh, can actually do the, its intended job. And so depending on the type of animal or organism that you're looking at, different areas of the DNA might be better at identifying organisms than others. So nowadays, barcoding is relatively recent. Uh, it was really sort of came about in the early 2000s. So it's not exactly a, uh, we're still sort of working out some of the, the bugs and there's sort of a lot of, there's some limitations with barcoding, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later. But for now, essentially, there's not really one good barcoding gene for all living things which is sort of unfortunate. If we could find that, that would be perfect. However, um, depending on if you're talking about plants or animals or fungus or bacteria, you might wanna use a different uh, gene. So, or gene region, I should say. So for plants, one of the common, or a couple of the common uh, genes or gene, partial genes, I should say, that are used um, are the gene RBCL, which is a um, part of the Rubisco uh, protein. Um, Matt K, it's another one. And then for animals, we typically use cytochrome oxidase 1, which is, or CO1 for short, which is found in the mitochondrial genome. And so uh, picking one of barcoding gene is, is pretty important. So you want to have just enough differences, just enough single nucleotide polymorphisms between different organisms to be able to tell organisms apart. But you don't want to have too many differences so that it really doesn't tell you anything. And you don't want to have them to be too similar either because then you really can't differentiate one species from another. So picking a barcoding, uh, the right barcoding gene or the or gene region is pretty important. So it's all about variation. So again, that's referring to the amount of single nucleotide polymorphisms, the variable, the variability of a particular region of DNA. So it's almost like, a, I always like to think of it as, as Goldilocks and the three bears. Uh, you want to have that barcoding gene that's just right, just enough variation to be able to help you answer your question and identify or tell the differences between different organisms. So barcoding is a pretty simple process and on a, theoretically anyway, and I, I wanted to sort of go through it. The, the emphasis of today's presentation is not necessarily on the methodology behind barcoding. It's really about the application and why it's so important. So I'm gonna sort of quickly go through these. We will have, we actually already have a, a couple of videos up on our DNA LC Live webpage that go over some of the different steps of barcoding. And you know, in the next few weeks, we'll have some more up there as well. So if you wanna get more into the procedure and the lab, the wet lab portion of this, uh, you, you can refer to some of those. But the general idea with barcoding is you get an organism, whether it's a plant, a bug, a coral, whatever you're, whatever you're talking about, and then you have to figure out how to extract DNA from that organism. That's one of the trickier uh, steps of this process because all organisms are not necessarily uh, the same and they're not necessarily occurring in the same types of environments. So for instance, if you were to try to extract DNA from a plant, that might be pretty easy. But if you're trying to extract DNA from, let's say, a coral, which is a, um, a symbiotic sort of community of organisms, in fact, of uh, microbes as well as animals and sometimes plants, uh, it gets a little bit more tricky. Um, you might need to use different types of extraction methods. One of the common methods that we use, which is right below uh, number two over here, step number two, is silica resin. And it's basically just a little microscopic bead that will help you to, uh, that will help essentially attract DNA away from all the rest of the impurities that we're not interested in. Another technique might be the use of liquid nitrogen for some tougher critters to try to extract DNA from. Or even if you were to try to extract DNA from a, a bone or something like that, it would be a little harder to get at that DNA. So you might need a, a really, really rigorous way to, to sort of pulverize uh, that particular sample. But either way, you go through the steps of DNA extraction, which usually involve breaking up your taking a, a piece of organism, a small piece that is, breaking it up into smaller pieces, as small as possible, and liberating the DNA into a buffer solution. 
from that point, you can use something like silica resin or uh, various different centrifugation or filtering, where you can essentially purify out the DNA and clean it up with like something like a wash buffer, which will help to get rid of all that nasty stuff. Your goal essentially is to get a purified sample of DNA. Once you have that purified sample of DNA, depending on the organism that you're trying to work with, step number three up here on the presentation is to go ahead and try to amplify a particular target barcoding gene or barcoding locus. And so again, that would be referring to like CO1 for animals or RBCL for plants, et cetera. And so the amplification of a particular target region of DNA can be achieved through a process known as polymerase chain reaction. Polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, is a very, very important process or technique in molecular biology. And if you guys are, any of you guys watching or students out there, uh, it would behoove you to really know that process backwards and forwards, because if you're planning on going into molecular biology one day, uh, it is so critical to carrying out various different lab protocols. Uh, once you have gone ahead and uh, performed or carried out your PCR, your next step is to verify that you've actually amplified the gene region or gene that you're expecting. So barcoding genes tend to be, or barcoding gene regions tend to be anywhere between like maybe 500 and 1,000 base pairs in length. That's bases, the number of like nitrogenous bases sort of laid out. And so um, if you are planning to amplify, let's say, CO1, for example, you know that, that you can expect that size to be uh, somewhere around you know, 700 base pairs, 600 to 700 base pairs in length. So the way that you would figure out if you've actually successfully amplified PCR, uh, amplified your gene region through PCR, is through the process of gel electrophoresis, another critical wet lab technique that you need to know, especially if you're a student in high school or even an undergraduate in uh, college. Uh, gel electrophoresis is a process by which, uh, um, process that allows you, I should say, to separate out DNA on the basis of its molecular weight uh, or its size, so the length of the fragment. And so the image up here on the screen is a sample from a lab that I recently did where students uh, that came to the, visited us at the DNA Learning Center went ahead and amplified DNA from actually a bunch of butterflies that I brought in for them. They had beautiful amplification and you can see these little bands right here that tells you uh, that CO1 successfully amplified in each one of these particular specimens. And we compare that over here to this sort of this L uh, column here. And this L is basically just a ladder. It's a reference marker showing you that the CO1 Ampli amplicon, we call it, is sort of right in the range where it should be. After you've gone ahead and checked that you've had successful amplification, the final step is to sequence your uh, PCR amplicons, to sequence those gene regions that you amplified through PCR. And so uh, sequencing is a um, sort of similar to PCR. It's very similar, actually. And it basically involves giving you back or getting you back a, a literally a readout or a, a piece of data that will tell you every single base at every single position in the DNA. Oh, sorry, the butterflies are getting in the way there. I want their time in the spotlight, I guess. So um, down here on the screen here, I have a couple of sequences, some sample sequences that were returned from this sample data set. And on the right here, what's been constructed is a phylogenetic tree or a, a, a cladogram. And so a phylogenetic tree is kind of like a tree outside where each of the branches represent the relatedness between different organisms or more precisely taxa in the particular data set so that the longer the branches, the sort of or I should say the, the further away two organisms are, the number of branches between them tells you uh, how well, I should say the closer they are, uh, the, the fewer number of branches between them tell you how closely related those organisms are. And so you can essentially build a phylogenetic tree using the molecular data that you collect from an experiment like this. But more importantly, if you're just trying to simply identify a creature, you would take the sequence data that you get back and you would compare it to a data set of known sequences. And that's critical. Without that data set of known sequences, you really can't do barcoding. That's actually one of the limitations of barcoding. Uh, there's so many organisms out there that I don't think the data for all of those 
the genetic data that is for all of those organisms is really in one place. So that can be one of the limitations of barcoding. But ideally, you'd want to compare it to a nice complete data set. So for example, NIH has um, this uh, database called GenBank, and they have a search tool called BLAST, which stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. And basic a lot, the BLAST application allows you to essentially take a sequence that you've gotten back and you sort of just copy and paste it in place, and you compare it to all of the other sequences in their database. And it'll basically uh, align that sequence up to all of the different subject sequences in the database. And it will tell you how the, uh, how related, or how, it'll give you a, a percent identi identification match to a particular organism, essentially answering your question. And that's basically it. That's how barcoding works. So it's actually pretty straightforward. You know, why is this so important? I mean, there are people out there that could come in here and tell every species of plant and every species of butterfly in the butterfly exhibit. But so why do you even need barcoding? Well, I'm in a unique position here because I sort of have gotten this molecular background from working at the DNA Learning Center. And I have had this uh, career in entomology for much of my life. I've actually been working in butterfly exhibits for about 20 years, since I'm 10 years old, um, basically interacting and educating uh, the public on butterfly biology and insect biology. And uh, I've just, I, I can't get enough of it. And to me, it's very clear why barcoding is so important. We're gonna sort of lay out those reasons uh, momentarily. Um, but I wanted to just give you a little bit of background. So if you look at this presentation here, or at the, uh, sorry, the presentation up on the board here, you'll see that uh, I have a couple of pictures. These are all pictures taken at the aquarium. Um, my favorite insects and invertebrates, I mean, my favorite animals, period, are moths, believe it or not. Not many people would say they really enjoy moths, but I love them. Um, in the picture here, I have, whoops, sorry, sorry, go back to that. In the picture here, the second image, I have two of my favorite moths. These are moths that I'd wanted ever since I was a little kid, and a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity of finally getting a chance to raise them here at the aquarium. Uh, these are called the Isis moon moth, or another name for it is the Sulawesi moon moth from, uh, from Southeast Asia. They're relatives of the Luna moth that we have around here on, in uh, the Northeastern United States. But they're just absolutely exquisite to me. Um, I actually have a few moths. You guys are lucky. This is a, they never, they hardly, they haven't come out in the last few weeks, but suddenly today, like it was meant to be, a couple of them just emerged. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you some of those. Now bear with me, this might be a little awkward. I'm gonna try to get them up to the camera here um, just so that you guys can see them. So this is not the Sulawesi moon moth. This is called an African moon moth. Try to get it focused on there for you guys. I don't know if you guys can see that. There we go. So this is called an African moon moth. It comes from South Africa in, uh, and it is a relative of those moths I was just talking about. Um, it has these two gigantic tails down here, which up until a few years ago, they were thought to simply uh, be uh, there to fake out predators and make predators think that the head of the animal was down here, but the actual head of the moth is right up here. I don't know if you can see his little, his little face here. There you go. Beautiful, there you go. You see the little antenna there. Um, believe it or not though, it's been recently shown that those two tails are meant to actually, if you guys notice how they're twirly, um, this is really, really cool, by the way. Uh, if you guys know, are familiar with bats, if how they find their food, they essentially use sound to find their food. They use echolocation. They send out a sound wave uh, up to moths flying around in the night sky. The sound wave hits the moth, comes back to the bat, and the bat knows exactly where it is, and it goes to try to eat it. Now, um, oh, let me, hold on one sec. I just realized I gotta stop sharing my screen here, I believe. Sorry, guys, bear with me. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Stop share, stop share. When do I do that? Show small. Oh, she flew away. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, 
well, my moth flew away, but I hope you guys got a chance to see that. You can go back and look at the recording and you should be able to maximize the video, but thankfully I did have a backup plan here. Um, so that moon moth that I was telling you about, the little twirly tails, they were meant to throw off the echolocating abilities of bats. So basically sound waves hit the bat, the sound waves go off in different directions, essentially scattering and confusing the bat. So the bat doesn't even know where to look for the moth. Um, but I have another moth here. This guy also just came out this morning. And this is actually a first time moth for me. I've never seen this guy before. This is called Caligula. It's a moth from Japan. Not a very pretty, necessarily pretty moth. At the outright, at the outset, but uh, it is still one of the one of my favorite types of moths. Both of these guys are called giant silkworm moths, and so they're huge. They're about the largest ones can be about twelve inches across in wingspan, and so. Um, anyway, these guys essentially got me into uh, insects and spiders when I was really little, and I've loved them ever since. So there are over a thousand species of these giant silkworm moths, which is pretty unbelievable. Just giant silkworm moths. That's not counting all the little moths that uh, sort of flutter around in your, uh, by, the port, by your porch light over the summer or anything like that. It's, it's just that one family of moths, 1,000 species. That's pretty crazy. And I've raised hundreds of species, but I don't think I could even tell you every single one that exists. Pretty crazy, right? So head back to my presentation here. Sorry about the uh, sort of mix up there for a second. Anyway, um, the reason that I, I sort of showed you those guys is because, you know, I, it's clear to me that it's helpful to have another tool in your arsenal when it comes to identifying organisms. Um, even up here in these images on, on my presentation here, you'll notice that uh, the, hang on one sec guys, let me make it a little bit bigger for you. There we go. You'll notice that on the presentation here, I have two spiders as well. These two spiders look kind of similar. I mean, I guess they kind of look a little bit different. If you saw them side by side, they would look probably very different to you. One seems like it's a little hairier than the other, but they're completely unrelated. The guy on the left here is known as the David Bowie Huntsman. Believe it or not, David Bowie, uh, because the scientists who described this thought that the flashy colors on the spider um, reminded him of a rock star. So he went ahead and called him David Bowie. It's heteropoda David Bowie. I, I guess, uh, which is kind of funny. And then the guy over here, the third spider in, is called the Brazilian wandering spider. And this is one of my favorite spiders because it is one of the most dangerous spiders in the world. And I happen to have a couple of those here today. I'm gonna show you those later. So um, they're really cool. I love spiders. I mean, these guys, I, I used to be deathly afraid of spiders when I was younger. And suddenly uh, I took a class in spider biology at, a, uh, with, at Cornell University with Dr. Linda Rayer. Linda, if you ever see this, um, thank you so much for everything you've done for me. <laughs> uh, she, but she basically inspired me to love spiders. So even up until college, I was kind of like deathly afraid of spiders, which is pretty crazy. Um, but anyway, these spiders look almost the same, but they're completely different. Very different, actually. On the right-hand side, just to, for a little fun aside, I have a little caterpillar. Um, this is a caterpillar of a Chinese paper kite. It's a big giant white butterfly that looks kind of like a monarch from uh, uh, Southeast Asia. In fact, you may have the one that the big white butterfly that was fluttering at the camera earlier. That is a Chinese paper kite. And uh, the reason that I put a caterpillar up here in the first place is because when you think about it, those thousand giant silkworm moth species that I told you about before, each and every one of them has their own specific cocoon, their pupa, and their own specific caterpillar and their own specific egg. So if you're trying to identify these guys, not only do you have to know the adult form of the insect, but you have to know all of the other life stages as well. So right there, that's 4,000 species. So guess how many different species of butterflies and moths are in existence, or at least that we know of? Well, if you guess over 100,000, you would be correct. There are about 170,000 species of butterflies and moths alone. That's just butterflies and moths. I'm not counting any other insect. That's crazy when you think about it. So there's a lot, and then if you consider the fact that each of them have their own particular life stage, that's a lot of different insects to be able to identify. So <clears throat> one of the most important aspects of, of barcoding is the fact that there are a vast number of species on Earth. So the tables up here sort of summarize uh, numbers of different species that we know of out there. Um, so we have 
you know, the vertebrates, we have the mammals, the birds, the reptiles, you know, they really, they're not that numerous. The fishes are pretty numerous. There's over 30,000 species of fishes. I think the last uh, estimate was about 32,500 that I saw on a database called Fishbase. Um, invertebrates, there are an immense number of invertebrate animals out there. So insects clearly dominate the, the herd here. There are over a million described species of insects a million described species of insects. One of the largest groups of insects, one of the largest groups of animals, period, are beetles. Uh, numbering, coming in at about 400,000 species of beetles. That's insane. Um, I forget the statistic, but I, I believe it's 80% of all animal species are thought to be insects. That's amazing. Uh, the invertebrates in general wound up, ta wind up taking quite a, quite a, an, uh, um, demonstrate quite a lot of biodiversity. So if you think of like spiders, for example, there's about 48,000 described species of spiders currently. Uh, ticks and mites, you may never, never really think about them, but they're really, really important arachnids. They live in soil, they actually live everywhere, um, at least mites do. And uh, there are thought to be, I think there are no, currently about 48,000 species of them known as well. So when it comes right down to it, there are a lot of animals, a lot of uh, organisms out there. Uh, Finally, the plants over on the far right here, notice that they, the uh, number of plants out there is over 300,000 species. So flowering plants alone, that's plants like uh, these guys back here that produce these nice, big, beautiful flowers or grasses or something like that, which also produce flowers. Um, but there are about almost 300,000 species of them alone. And so uh, this is not even the total number of species that's thought to exist. Uh, in fact, it's thought that there are over, um, probably like double the amount of currently described species that we know of at the moment. It's insane. And so unfortunately though, because of well, a lot of things, but a lot of human activities in particular, uh, species are going extinct every day and the rate of, uh, of extinction is hard to approximate. Um, but you know, species are probably blipping out of existence you know, at, a, at an unprecedented rate. Um, and so we're losing, or we're really not capturing a lot of those species just by using traditional methods of uh, identification. It takes a really long time to identify certain groups of insects. We, or even, uh, or animals in general, we have, uh, there, are in, there are crustaceans that live in fresh water and on beaches and in the ocean. You may have seen them before. They look kind of like little, I think people um, call them sand fleas. They sort of hop around on the beach side. Uh, they don't bite you. At least the ones on the beach don't really bite you and draw it and suck your blood by the way. Um, however, they're called sand, flea, sand fleas and they're, they're a type of crustacean known as an amphipod. Amphipods, there are about 10,000 species out there. And the key, the dichotomous key, that's a, basically a text that's used to try to identify uh, each of those different um, creatures or any a group of different uh, creatures, I should say. Uh, the key for identifying amphipods, one of the biggest ones that I am used to using is about probably like a couple thousand pages. It's huge and it doesn't even get all the different species. So it takes a long time sometimes to try to actually accurately identify species. And that's even if you know what if you, the species that you have has been described by scientists. So let me give you an idea of how complicated it can get. So let's see if you can name the species. So let's start off with an easy one. I'm in a butterfly exhibit, right? But I told you what my favorite group of animals is, so chances are that's probably gonna be the first answer. So up on the, the board here, we have a a shiny, pretty looking, what it seems to be a butterfly. But it turns out that this is actually a moth. It's called a Madagascan sunset moth. It comes from the island of Madagascar. It's actually endemic there. Um, and it is a gorgeous, beautiful animal. It, it, you know, and most people think of moths as ugly, sort of nasty colors, but these guys really are uh, definitely not definitely not ugly. They, they come out during the day. Um, they have these shimmery, sort of iridescent patches all over their, all over their wings. Um, but to a person who may not be familiar with um, um, insects, this might look like a butterfly. Let's go try a different, different one. Let's try a little bit of a harder one. So look at this guy. What do you guys think this might be? So at first glance, you might think of this, might think this is like a flea or maybe a, a louse or some sort of small uh, parasitic organism. And it is a parasitic organism, but you're never going to guess what it is. Turns out it's a fly, believe it or not. So even though it doesn't look like a fly as we're used to seeing them, um, it is in fact a fly. And so the, 
this is a forward fly and forward flies are, are sort of little, they have a lot of different uh, life habits. They can be little sort of detritivores or decomposers feeding on dead stuff in the soil. Oftentimes they are parasitic, meaning that they live at the expense of other organisms. This guy is a, this guy is called uh, thaum, Thaumatoxena and Thaumatoxena is a, a parasite in termite colonies. So it flies into termite colonies and sort of takes advantage of all the termites hard work and it feeds off of um, sort of uh, the sort of the food that the, the termites cultivate. And so um, but you never, you may never have gotten that one if you really were not used to seeing these. In fact, when I first saw this image, I had no idea what it was. And I'm an entomologist, trained as an entomologist. All right, good luck with this one. What do you guys think this is? This is actually a drawing from 1967. It's actually something that everyone probably, or a lot of, a lot of people might be familiar with. So, turns out, this guy is a larval form of the giant Japanese spider crab. It's called a zoe. A zoe are essentially the larval, the, one of the first larval stages of crustaceans. Um, and so uh, this guy looks nothing like the giant Japanese hermit crab, which you can see up on the top right there. Uh, this guy, these guys can get 10 to 12 feet in leg span. They're huge crabs that live deep down in the ocean. Um, but if you were to find this guy floating around in the ocean, in the water column, you know, who even knows? You would never be able to figure out uh, you know, what it is. You might be able to figure out it's a type of zooplankton, but where do you go from there? So unless you're a specialist in this field, you may not actually have any idea what that is. And I have one more. I don't even know if that looks like an animal. You know, this could be a joke. I could just be giving you something that you would, you know, have you guys scratching your heads. So it turns out this is an image of a fly larva um, called a Blepharis sarid. And specifically, it's Bibio... Uh, Bibliocephala grandis, or Bibliocephala, I'm sorry, grandis. And so this guy comes from Colorado, um, and we actually do have these Blepharoceras up in the northern parts of the United States. So if you're tuning in from Long Island, we do, you can find these guys in fresh water around here. And so Blepharoceras, they essentially look like, you know, triangles. They don't really look like actual animals. And uh, they have these little suckers that allow them to sort of grab onto the, to a running freshwater stream, and they sort of eat, eat algae off of the, the rocks and move, move along through the stream. And by the way, guys, if you're ever uh, taking a freshwater uh, ecology class and you find something that you have no idea what it is, it's probably a fly larva. Uh, they're very, very diverse and, and almost alien in the way that they appear. Um, anyway, so my point in showing you all those was that, that it's hard to identify things very often. But that's not the only problem. We don't even really know what a species is. There, I mean, there are a lot of definitions of, a, of the word species out there, but you know, there's not really a very good solid def definition. So sometimes you can have variation in species uh, that you would, you know, where you would essentially think that they're um, different organisms. They, you know, you might have a variable different types of butterflies, and actually I have a couple I'm gonna show you in a moment. Um, or you might have, have butterflies that look exactly the same or, or organisms that look exactly the same, but they're completely different species. Some organisms will hybridize with each other. So different types of butterflies, for example, will try to uh, mate with each other and they form these sort of offshoot hybrids. And it kind of gets confusing as to what species is what. Um, and then you have this concept of sexual dimorphism as well. So sexual dimorphism is a little, you know, sometimes you can, you can look at two animals and, and never even think that they're, they're the same organism. So I have a couple of things that I wanted to show you. I'm going to stop sharing here for a moment. And I'm going to take out a couple of butterflies. So bear with me. These guys may not cooperate. They've been fluttering around in here. But we're going to do our best. So I have a couple of butterflies here. So I have this guy. Let me get it focused here for you. So I have this guy and there we go. I don't know if you guys can see that. So I have this butterfly who, you know, he looks pretty unique, pretty distinct. He's got these two little red bands. But then I've got this guy who looks like a completely different butterfly altogether. Oh, flew away. I got one more. Okay, so butterflies aren't the best model for this. But <laughs> point is, if you noticed, if you got even a passing glimpse at those two specimens, they look 
very different from each other, but it turns out they're the same species. Those are called postman longwings from South America. And uh, it's been shown that these postmen, actually a lot of the longwings, they all come from South America and uh, South and Central America, I should say. You know, one second, let me get back to where we were at. They all come from Central and South America. And so up on the board here, I have an image of all of the different types of uh, two species only. So Heliconius errato, the so-called small postman, and Heliconius melpomene, the so-called postman. <laughs> small postman, large. And then there's postman, and there's also a large postman as well. But these are just the small postman and the postman. But the species that I just showed you were all Heliconius errato. Now, if you're a really talented lepidopterist, that's someone who studies or knows butterflies and moths, you can actually tell the difference between two different between the errato and the, the melpomenes by looking at the underside of the wings in some forms. There's like a yellow bar that will go all the way to the edge of the wing in a errato, and then it won't go all the way to the edge of the wing in a melpomene. But you know, how are you gonna know that? If you look up here on the board, there are so many different varieties of Heliconius errato and Heliconius melpomene. They actually form these gigantic, what are called mimicry rings, Mullerian mimicry rings. So it turns out they're all toxic and they benefit uh, each other actually by looking like one another so that predators learn to avoid uh, their particular color patterns just so that um, you know if a, a, a monkey or whatever eats one of these long wings that's just fluttering by here they'll get sick and they'll say well never going to eat that black and red thing ever again and so all of the species will benefit so they all like to look like each other but it's very confusing as you can see by the the board here it's hard to tell the difference between those two now what if i gave you something like this. These guys won't fly away. So I have a couple of stick insects here. So stick insects, of course, hang on one sec. Let me get them sort of situated here on the same hand. There you go. Can you guys see them? So stick insects, look like sticks and they benefit by looking like sticks because uh, predators will essentially avoid eating them. They won't even be able to see them. Now, what do you guys think? Are these the same species of stick insect or two different species? So, I mean, they're sitting right side by side and, and now that they're doing that, they kind of look like they're the same thing. They kind of look like they're different things just because one's brown and one is green. So they actually are two different species. This guy is a uh, metaeuroidea stick insect and this guy is Romulus. It's a different type of stick insect. And they both come from Southeast Asia, but they look virtually identical. Uh, I have another one here though. What about that? Are these guys all different? Or are they similar or the same? What's the deal? So this is yet another species of stick insect. They're actually very distantly related as well. This is Fabaticus serratopes from Malaysia. Uh, this actually winds up becoming a stick insect that's the size of my arm. It's huge. Um, so these are three different species, but what about these guys? I know, I know. Shouldn't have any trouble seeing these guys. These guys are huge. So check these guys out. Whoop. Oh, hold on. <laughs> All right. So check these guys out. She's a little angry right now. She doesn't really like this. So what do you guys think? Same species, different species? What's the deal? So it turns out these are the same species. This is what we mean by sexual dimorphism. So the boy and the girl look very different from each other. So this is a female Malaysian jungle nymph or Heteropteryx dilatata. And this is a male Heteropteryx dilatata. They're so different that the male has wings. He just sort of showed them off for you. Um, 
and can fly, well, can fly sort of. <laughs> the female does not have the ability to fly, but she still has these little tiny wings. And I don't know if you guys can hear that, but that's her making that noise. She's stridulating. She's basically telling me that she's angry and she wants me to let go of her uh, and put her back, which I'm going to actually do. But so again, it can be a little confusing. If you're not quite sure what you're uh, dealing with, you don't have a lot of experience with it, um, you may have trouble identifying organisms. Barcoding, however, would not have that same problem. So both of those specimens that I just showed you, if you were to take a sample and um, go through the steps of barcoding that I showed you earlier, they would essentially have identical sequences, thus answering the question. They're telling you that they're the same species, whereas those three stick insects that I showed you would each have very different sequences. So let's get back. So why else is barcoding important? Go ahead and share screen again. Sorry, guys. Okay. So, not only is it uh, hard to identify species, even if you know what you're talking about, but it can be hard to interpret scientific literature sometimes. So some people spend their entire lives trying to identify uh, one genus or one group of different species. And it can be very difficult. And they have to come up with words and terminology to describe what it is that they're talking about. So here's a little snippet from a, uh, a dichotomous key, or actually a diagnosis rather, of a particular uh, specimen of beetle here. And I just, in the, in the sort of snippet here, all of the sort of complicated words are underlined. And so if you're not familiar with this, you're gonna have to go and look up each and every one of those words. And then plus, sometimes you don't always get, have the liberty of working with nice, perfect specimens. Very often, actually, you don't. You have to come, you have to sort of figure out what things are based on like you know, part, of a, part of a specimen because it's missing legs or missing wings or something like that. And sometimes the difference between one species and another might come down to a very small hair on the presence of their leg or something like that. So it can be pretty difficult to identify things. Um, barcoding can deal with a lot of these problems. So theoretically, you can use barcoding to identify anything, theoretically. Again, we'll talk about the limitations in a moment. All you need is a small piece as well. So even if you do have a damaged specimen, no problem. You can go ahead and extract DNA from the, a part of the leg of one specimen if you really needed to. You also, you don't really need specialized training. At the DNA Learning Center, we carry out this barcoding procedure successfully with high school students every single year for the last, uh, I don't even know, five, five or six years we've been doing this. So it's definitely possible to do this without specialized training. You don't have to be a special, you know, an entomologist or whatever to actually do this correctly. Um, and then you can differentiate between similar species as well. So again, there are some limitations. So one of the limitations that I mentioned earlier is that sometimes you don't always have the, the, uh, the um, ability to access a complete and total database of all sequence information. The other problem is, as I mentioned very earlier in the presentation, sometimes different barcoding uh, genes will work well for one animal or one organism, but they won't work well for others. So even within animals, for example, uh, CO1, for instance, is not variable enough at least we think, to differentiate between various different types of certain types of coral, for example. And so because there's not enough variation, you can't really use it to separate one species from another. Um, so there are definitely some limitations. But it's still worth considering. So uh, basically, we have uh, in, in the fields of zoology and conser conservation, um, barcoding is actually has a lot of um, practical purpose. And so just a little bit about, you know, the, the, first of all, the point of a zoological institution, or one of the major goals of most zoological institutions is the preservation and conservation of species, as well as educating about uh, living creatures and biology um, uh, of these different organisms. And so uh, various, in the United States, at least, various different agencies will regulate sort of the um, the importation from other countries or the interstate movements so or shipping things across state lines of different types of wildlife or organisms. Um, and other organizations will even regulate how or stipulate how they're supposed to be cared for. So for example, Fish and Wildlife, FWS here in the presentation, and the USDA uh, regulate the importation and the interstate movement of butterflies and moths and other insects. Um, 
AZA, or the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, um, basically is a, it's a nonprofit uh, accreditation agency that if you're a, a zoological institution and you have that AZA accreditation, that basically means that you're following the golden rule of animal care. That means you give your animals a certain amount of space, you, you give them enough enrichment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, these guidelines of containment and animal care are critical. And um, so for instance, with USDA, uh, we essentially apply, so butterfly exhibits essentially apply for permits with the USDA to, um, for the importation and for the interstate movement of various different, what they call pest articles. So a butterfly, you know, sadly, is considered a pest article because they lay eggs on plants. They have this close association with plants. And so you have to be authorized in order to have um, various different types of butterflies, to be able to receive, I should say, various different types of butterflies in your exhibit. Same thing can be said for insect zoos. Um, basically, we were, we were able to get a certain amount of beetles or grasshoppers or ants or whatever uh, based on the containment guidelines that we provide to the USDA. And um, basically, the way that butterfly houses work is there are farmers throughout the world that rear some of these exotic butterflies in their backyards. So they'll literally go out in, their, in the rainforest in Costa Rica, for example, and they will uh, go ahead and they will go ahead and extract DNA. They will go ahead and raise various different uh, species that, can, that occur in their area. And it's because they have access to the plants that these things rely on. So it's a lot easier for them to do. Um, so up on the board here, I have actually a picture from a butterfly farm in Southeast Asia in the Philippines, I believe, um, that has uh, these big golden things sort of dangling down here. Those are the chrysalises of the Chinese paper kite. Uh, they are... Uh, that's actually the butter, the caterpillar that I had shown you earlier. Um, so these are basically these farms rear hundreds and hundreds of butterflies to ship them out as chrysalises to uh, butterfly exhibits throughout the world. And so uh, they literally come in boxes that are just like FedEx boxes wrapped in cotton and toilet paper and whatnot. Um, and then I have a picture here from Butterfly Dan. He's one of my friends down in Florida. So we have butterfly breeders even here in the United States. And so the USDA tells us what, tells the exhibits what types of species we're allowed to get based on our containment guidelines. And so, um, for example, they're concerned with as one of these pests, one of these butterflies getting out into the wild and establishing themselves as a pest. Insect zoos, again, work in very much the same way. The reason that they are concerned with this is because uh, these butterflies are considered pests very often from where they're located. So like the owl butterfly, which is this big guy right here, I'm not even gonna go up to the, Actually, no. If you guys look on the presentation here, there's this butterfly right down here called a Great Mormon Swallowtail from Southeast Asia. They love to lay eggs on citrus, so orange and grapefruit and things like that. So if you're a butterfly exhibit in Florida, the USDA is a little bit more sort of strict about whether or not you can, you can have these guys flying in your exhibit because if one of them get out into, your, into the, the wild of Florida, they might lay eggs on citrus plantations and be, establish themselves as a pretty serious pest. Um, ants are the same way, and ants can be even worse. So this is a leafcutter ant down here. So we have three leafcutter ant colonies up here in Long Island, and if they ever got out, they would probably not be able to survive. But if you live in, if you have a butterfly exhibit or an insect zoo in Texas or Florida or something like that, they might get out and they might establish themselves. So you have to be very careful. And the reason that they are concerned with this is not just for agriculture, but also for local populations of uh, organisms. So it's possible that one of these um, pest articles can get out and then sort of outcompete a locally occurring species and essentially um, sort of displace them and make it so that they, the wild, the local species cannot survive any more, anymore. Um, we would call something like that an invasive species. Um, and then it also is to, to limit the spread of insect-borne disease to both insect populations as well as plants. So a lot of times beetles and butterflies and things like that, they're kind of like mosquitoes for plants. They actually can transfer viruses, plant viruses and plant diseases from one plant to another just by their interaction with those plants. So they're worried about that as well. And so, you know, unfortunately, the years that I've been doing this, it's, it seemed clear that sometimes um, some of these breeders, and I don't think they're doing this on purpose, they'll send the wrong thing or there'll be something that's mislabeled. And it's just because it's, it's, again, it's very hard to tell the difference between species sometimes. And if you're a farmer, you know, you may not really be as concerned with trying to like sit there with a key and trying to identify a particular butterfly. Um, but it's possible that DNA barcoding could be used uh, in um, sort of this 
sort of shipment, shipment, shipment management by either the USDA or Fish and Wildlife to, ver to verify the, identi the identifications of various different invertebrates that are coming through the mail. And that, again, not to really clamp down on and, and, and be highly regulatory, but it just makes sure that everything is as precise as it needs to be. So just because two butterflies look similar, it may not necessarily be that they are, um, oops, sorry guys, hold on one sec. Just because two butterflies look similar, it may not necessarily be uh, that they are, whoop, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, it may not necessarily be that they are actually, um, they have actually similar biology. So there are some butterflies that they're so specific with the plants that they lay eggs on that um, they will only survive on one species of plant, but not another. So if you're kind of unsure about what butterfly you're getting or, or shipping or receiving, um, you may not be able, you may, you may actually be creating a problem for yourself or for your local environment. Um, and so, you know, insects are cool too, but you know, zoology is a big field, and I think primarily most zoos and aquariums are interested in sort of conserving a lot of these sort of larger, more charismatic species, such as elephants or uh, endangered cats or something like that. And so when it comes to wildlife conservation and management, you know, the, the, it's the job that, that wildlife uh, managers need to carry out can sometimes be invasive or sort of damaging to the animal, but it's just sort of out of necessity. So drawing blood from animal or, or an animal or, or tracking the animal or something. And it can be damaging in both behavioral as well as physical ways. So in the image here, we have um, some wildlife managers in, um, I think, South Africa, essentially, or uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, rather, trying to basically to tranquilize an elephant and they're, I guess, doing blood tests or whatever. Um, but even if you, you know, that's a physical sort of invasiveness, but uh, even just like following an animal around can sort of disturb it and make it not behave as it normally would because it's going to constantly be on edge, essentially. Um, so enter DNA barcoding. How can DNA barcoding help us to sort of identify uh, endangered animals or threatened animals in a non-invasive way? Right? We don't want to mess with, especially threatened species, right? Threatened species or endangered species where there are very few of them left out there because we don't want to damage them any more than they already are, essentially. Uh, so how can DNA barcoding help us, do you think? Well, let me ask you a question. So in these three images that we have up here, what do you see in common between all three of these? So I have a, a cheetah over here. It's kind of pooping. So cheetah, cheetah scout, that's that, <laughs> that's that little poop right there. I have a metallic ornamental tarantula here that just shed its skin. So here's the tarantula. By the way, invertebrates grow by shedding their skin and they leave behind their old molt skin. So what about, what does this molt skin and this piece of scat have in common with say something like an elephant tusk? Well, turns out they all come from endangered animals. So yet, believe it or not, spiders and things like that can be endangered as well. So you guys probably are familiar, cheetahs and uh, African ele elephants are definitely endangered, but there are even endangered spiders. So the metallic ornamental tarantula is actually a critically endangered tarantula from Southeast Asia. And so we don't really want to damage them. We don't want to hurt the animals to try to extract uh, DNA from them or try to um, identify them or try to sort of track where, they are, where they're located. However, the scat, the molt skin, and the elephant tusk all contain DNA. So we might be able to use DNA barcoding to sort of answer questions related to these organisms and to their, their management in a very non-invasive way. That's pretty cool when you think about it. So like if you were, let's say, a, uh, a wildlife manager, so basically you'd wanna, you'd wanna try to identify, extract DNA and identify uh, organisms from things that they leave behind, like feathers, skin samples, um, uh, feces, et cetera. And so this is like, this is like the ideal situation that you really want. And it turns out that we've actually have uh, students right now working on the extraction of DNA from tarantula molt skins. This has actually been done already, um, but we're having a difficult time replicating the, the results. And uh, we have some high school students working on that right now, um, actually in conjunction with uh, Disney's Animal Kingdom in Florida, because they're, they have a conservation program down there and they were interested in doing that with us. So pretty cool. So if you're a, a, a fish and wildlife officer at like the, an international airport, for example, you might encounter some products that you think are made from uh, elephant ivory. And you can verify, you could actually design an experiment to verify whether or not those products contain elephant ivory, basically doing a barcoding experiment, very much like I mentioned to you before. 
Okay. I think we're good. All right. So um, sorry about that. Live, <laughs> live streaming. Always fun. Anyway, so uh, last but not least, let me go ahead and share that last slide in the PowerPoint here with you. There's one more sort of application, and this is a relatively recent development, and it's this concept of what's known as meta barcoding or environmental DNA. So uh, you could use SCAT and things like that to try to identify and track the movements of various organisms. You could even study what an organism eats just by, by sort of extracting um, uh, samples from that SCAT and I'm trying to figure out what, what they originated from, what organism they originated from. Um, but you might also just simply go out into the environment and collect a water sample or a soil sample or something of that nature and um, amplify whatever types of DNA that you find there. And you would essentially choose similar barcoding genes. So eDNA or environmental DNA is sort of an up and coming methodology to try to do exactly this. So you can essentially come up with, you can amplify literally every single type of, of organism, organismal DNA that you find there and sort of get an idea of the profile of uh, what's found there. Or you could um, simply test for the presence or absence of a particular uh, organism as well. And so uh, that would allow you to track the movements, oceanic movements of large organisms like whales or tiger shark or uh, whale sharks or something like that, like I have in the image here. But anyway, so that's my piece on why DNA barcoding is important. I hope you guys found that uh, very sort of uh, uh, um, informative. And uh, we are actually going to be starting a uh, biodiversity series of talks in the next week or so. So join me next week and we're going to talk a little bit about metamorphosis and butterflies and other insects. So we'll uh, kind of go over some of that as well. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed. Have fun out there. Be safe. and We'll see you next time.